wanna be close, close to your side. So heaven is real and death is a lie. I wanna hear voices of angels above singing as one, singing.
There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be Okay. Well, everybody's so friendly this Thursday night. It's, it's wonderful to see. Um, we are in a new sermon series called Greater. Now, remember, our old sermon series doesn't go away because on our app and our website, um, we'll always be directing people in our congregation to take that step to um, check off the things that says that tells us that you're a kingdom builder. Uh, we have some things for you when you do that and some opportunities um, for you uh, that we'd like to hear from you about. So make sure you go on and, and, and do that. But we are moving on our sermon series. And this sermon series is special because we're going into the Easter 
season. We just have a couple weeks, and this is going to be a few weeks before and a little bit after Easter, and it's called Greater. And I love the sermon uh, graphic that uh, Kenny made for us. It's just, it's just kind of, um, kind of the, just the greatness of God. And obviously, uh, we're kind of going in theme. It won't feel like that, I don't think, in the sermons, but in the theme, it's kind of like the second grader. Always, you know, that's in Sunday school, always has the trump card, right? When they learn about God, you'll be like, okay, so-and-so's the best. You know who's better? You know who's great? God. You know, they kind of have it. And God's greater. Uh, you think you're smart. God's smarter. You know, it's kind of that second grade realization that you can always kind of tell somebody who's greater. And it's always God. You're always right. Well, we're, we're going to use that. But I don't think we say it. And I'm not sure we always mean it. First of all, um, we're always deciding that things are greater than other things all the time. We're always deciding that, whether we say it, verbalize it or not. Our subconscious, we, sh we shuffle things so fast. But we're going to say it. And I'm going to do uh, a little, we're going to just kind of do a little back and forth um, with this uh, God is greater stuff because I'm going to say some stuff and I want to point at you I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say some stuff that God is greater than. I'm going to point at you, and if you agree, you say he is. Okay, so let's try that. Uh, some things that God's word tells us that he's greater in. God is greater than your sickness. He's greater than your money. He's greater than your problems. He's greater than any human government or human council. Ready? Okay, so you agree with that. All right, that's good. Um, God is greater than your abuse. He's greater than your divorce. Uh, he's just greater. God is greater than the war in the Ukraine. He's greater than COVID or the vaccine or the next pandemic. God's greater than inflation or any president. All right, we're on the same page. God is greater than your house or your car. He's greater than your spouse or your children. God is greater than your biggest worry or your worst sin. You know, God is just greater. And I think when we go through a list like that, all of which the Bible would say is true, um, God solves and did solve all our biggest issues with the cross. But he's always done that. He's always solved our biggest issues, and he, and he always had it in mind. We're going to take a walk back um, through our Bible to see how God always planned to be greater than all these things. And there's a lot of them, right? Even some of them, when we say them out loud, when I say them out loud, they might even shock your heart a little bit to say that God, if you have kids, is greater than your kids. Or if you really love somebody, is greater than your spouse or someone you're dating. That shocks you a little bit sometimes. If it's greater than the, the most important thing in your life, it, it could shock you. But God has been planning on being greater than these things uh, through the whole Bible. I want to take you to a story found in Genesis 18, uh, verses 9 through 15. It's a well-known story. Um, they said to him, they're talking to Abraham, what happens here in the Old Testament is we see an instance where Jesus shows up as God in the Old Testament with two angels. He goes to visit Abraham and Sarah. They say, uh, where is Sarah, your wife? And he says, she is in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. And the uh, way of the woman had ceased to be with Sarah. So she laughed to herself, saying, After I'm worn out and my Lord is old, Shall I have the pleasure? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I de indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I'll return to you about this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. But Sarah denied it. She said, I didn't laugh, for she was afraid. He said, No, but you did laugh. I think this is such a hilarious exchange, and if you've been in a church a long time, maybe you've seen this. 
the promise of God was to Abraham, that he was going to bless all the nations of the earth. And we see that that happened through the cross of Christ and the preaching and the teaching of the gospel. The good news came later. But it starts, the promise starts with Abraham. And God had, the whole world uh, was split up at this time. And God said, I'm going to make my nation through two people who uh, can't have children. And by the way, they're too old to have children. And uh, the exchange here is she's embarrassed and she laughs. And he said, why'd you laugh? She said, well, I didn't laugh. Uh, and he said, yeah, you did laugh. I, I'd just love to see that, <laughs> that exchange. How does Jesus handle it when we're fibbing to him? Like, he's right there at the tent. And uh, how does Abraham, what does he do next? He's kind of like, oh, okay, yeah, she did laugh. Like, well, what's his reaction? I don't know. But there are a lot of times when we think about something and the Lord has promises for us in his word. And we don't believe him. I mean, can you imagine standing there talking with the Lord and say, and thinking, it can't happen. I'm too old. I don't think you're um, great enough for that, God. I don't know if you can do that. I don't know if you're going to want to. You're telling me you're going to, but I've never seen it happen. Isn't it interesting that when we don't see things happen, we're not sure they can happen. I, I just wonder if we could take from this that maybe this is one of the reasons we should never stop going to church. Maybe this is why people should go to a Bible teaching church to see lives that are healed and restored and, and giving and growing God's kingdom so that they know that that's possible. How do you know it's possible if you've never seen it before? Have you ever seen somebody live an extremely loving life towards the Lord, it looks different from the world. Somebody that's excited about the greatness of God and believes that God is greater than everything else on their earth, how do they live? Sometimes they drop everything and go and preach the gospel. Sometimes they just start changing their life little by little. And sometimes they jump a span and they, they start living their life in a mighty way and everybody's shocked. And, and the people around them see this and then people start coming to Christ. But listen, if you never go to church, you're never going to see that. Abraham and Sarah had never seen God do something like this. So they doubted it. What do you think the average Christian today is going to think about whether God's greater or not if they've never been to church and see it? What if, what's God challenging us to do? Well, he definitely always challenges us to know that he's greater than anything that we're dealing with. He's already taken care of it but we don't always believe him. And I think one of the reasons we're not always able to believe God is because we're not paying attention to the other people's lives in a healthy church, to people who really love the Lord. What is it possible that they can do? Well, God is greater. He can do all things. They're talking to the Lord and they don't know what's possible. Well, God is greater than all your doubts and all my doubts. <laughs> he is. God's greater than all your and my doubts. He is. In Genesis 22, 9 through 14, it says it, there's another incredible story, and it, and it predicts the coming of Christ. I don't know if you read it this way. It's about Abraham and his son Isaac, the son that he doubted he was going to have. Listen to the story. When they came to the place which God had told him, Abraham built an altar there and laid wood in order to bound his, his, uh, Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham reached out his hand and took a knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here I am. He said, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For I now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horn. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. What shall be provided? What was the Lord talking about? 
Well, you remember that the Lord was going to start his land and his people with a miracle through Abraham and Sarah. They could not have children, and they were too old to have children. And yet God started a family that the reason that you and I can set continents away, countries away, and worship the Lord Jesus is the promise of the blessing to the nations through Abraham. Then when he does get his son, that this promise goes to, remember the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's through that specific bloodline that God is going to bless the nations. God tests him and he says, you're going to take your son, the one of the blessing, and you're going to sacrifice him to me. Now, he was never going to let him do it. And, and Abraham's faith was, well, if, if he is sacrificed, God will raise him from the dead. Abraham knew that God's promise was going to be good. Why did he know that? Why did he have the confidence to do this thing that he would have never wanted to do because he already saw that God did a miracle earlier? It's kind of the way we get confidence to believe God. And he did it on the mountain that later, or the hill that later Jesus would be crucified on. This is an incredible story. But the whole thing is prophetic. God is telling him, listen, um, I'm going to provide the sacrifice. In fact, I will be the sacrifice. And the mount, it's called uh, the Lord, it shall be provided. Well, what? Our salvation. God's going to take care of it. He, he's always planned to be greater in your life than anything else. He knew what was going on and he knew um, what he was going to do. Well, God calls his shot. He's never been wrong. There are always problems in the world, and God always solves them. Think about that. When, what time in the world since the fall of man have there not been problems? God has always, through the prophets and the apostles, he's been telling us what's going to happen, how he's going to do it. He calls a shot, and he's never been wrong. Well, we need God to be greater because we've had a hard time keeping up our end of the bargain. See, there was a covenant between God and his people, the people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If we skip in our Bibles all the way up to Jeremiah 3, 7 through 8, we talk about this passage a lot. After seven, over 700 years of the northern house of Israel being unfaithful, they will not be faithful to God. They keep worshiping demonic gods the demonic gods of the nations that surround them, and they will not stop it. And God finally comes to him and he says, and I thought, after she's done all this, she'll return to me, but she did not return in her treacherous sister Judah. So uh, Israel split up into two parts, the northern part and the southern part. The southern part was Judah. She saw that for all the adulteries of the faithless one, Israel, I had sent her away with the decree of divorce. See, this covenant is like, is exactly like our marriage covenant. God had to give Israel a, a, a certificate of divorce. Now, there's two big problems with this. This is shocking in Scripture. When people first realize this Scripture, it kind of shows us how special God is and how great uh, the things that God did for us. When we come up to this part, why is Jesus on the cross have to happen? Why is it so miraculous? Well, God has a law. God has a law, and it cannot be broken. We start reading about this law in Deuteronomy 24.4. You should read Deuteronomy. Jesus quotes Deuteronomy uh, more than he does any other book. And here's what it says. Then, then her former husband, who was sent away from her, may not take her again to be his wife. This is talking about marriage between people. But what it's also talking about is the relationship that Lord ha the Lord has with Israel that covenant, that marriage contract. So it says, he's, if he sends her away, he may not take her again as a wife after she's been deviled, for that's an abomination before the Lord. And you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. Guess what happened? Israel has cheated on God, and she will not stop. He gives her a certificate of divorce, and, and it's horrible. They called, Jeremiah, they, they called Jeremiah the weeping prophet. Why? 
because it's just bad news after bad news. And he chimes in in Jeremiah 3, 1, right before this divorce is given, it says, if a man divorces his wife, she goes from him and becomes another man's wife, will he return to her? Would not the land be greatly polluted? You have played the whore with many lovers. Kind of sounds weird to say that, church. And would you return to me, declares the Lord. He's not talking about a specific marriage. He's quoting Deuteronomy. He's the weeping brother. He's saying, this is what's going to happen. And in fact, a few verses later, that's what happened. Now, the people of God, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the promise that goes out to the whole world, it's over. God divorced them. He got rid of them. They wouldn't quit cheating on him. He said, I've had enough. I thought you would turn back. You will not turn back. So here it is. In the law, and, and Jeremiah is telling the people, and, and we see and the, they knew the law very well in Deuteronomy. He will not take you back. This defiles the land of God, the very land on which you are standing. God knew it. He knew it from the very beginning, and he showed it to Adam and Eve. Do you know that? God revealed his plan early in the book of Genesis. Now, we didn't know all the things that were going to happen. We read them later. But why every year is the cross so important at the time of Easter or what we think of as, as Passover a few days after? What, why is, is the resurrection of the Lord so great? We needed it. We had to have it. Our whole existence depended on it. And what happened in Genesis kind of sets it. It's so early in your Bible. Sometimes we, we read our Bible and we read over things and we don't catch the kind of small details. And sometimes the details we think are small, they're not small at all. In fact, in Genesis 3.21, it says this. What's happened here is they have sinned. They have sinned against God and they realize they're naked and they so leaves together for clothes, and this is what happened. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothes of, where do you get skins from? You get skins from animals. You know nothing for a hundred years in the Garden of Eden had died. Nothing that took breath through the nostrils. If you get real technical in scripture, you're gonna find that nothing died. God was providing everything, all the nutrients, all the food, He's providing it through the plants. Nothing died. Not one animal ate another animal. And for the first time, Adam and Eve are looking at skins made for them to wear. There was going to have to be a sacrifice made. This is prophetic. This verse in this story is prophetic. It had to happen. And they realized right then that something was going to have to die in their place. And then God tells Abraham. And he does a miracle. And then he tells them again with his son Isaac. I don't know if you've ever signed a contract. Maybe you've never signed one, but if you've had to, you realize, man, there's sometimes there's pages and pages. If you ever bought a house, it's like so many pages. I don't know if you've done it. I've done it a few times. I just sign them. I don't even know what it says. I don't know if you bought a car. Let's try to go get a car at a dealership and get out. It's not going to happen. You're going to be there for hours. This is, this is the way it is. And you're going to sign and sign and sign. Why, why do we have to do that? Because it limits my responsibility and it limits their responsibility. That's what a contract's for. It details and, and it limits the things that I'm going to have to do and I'm responsible for. And the other party, it, it details what they're going to, and you're not going to do more and you're not going to do less. It's in the contract. And when somebody breaks the contract, right, then somebody's in trouble. But we don't have a contract with God. We have a covenant. And the covenant with God works the opposite way. Let me tell you why God is so much greater and why we should fully realize this all the time. Because God had a covenant with his people, right? In the Old Testament, and they broke it. They broke it, and he gave them a certificate of divorce. And, and then Jesus, what, he, he comes on the cross. And, and how can the woman, how can the, God's people later, now us, the church, how can the bride of Christ choose them back if the husband dies, then now she's free to remarry. 
Well, this is why Jesus died on the cross, because he's not going to break his own law. So this is how the covenant works. The covenant of marriage and the covenant between us and God does not work like this is the this is what I'm about. This is the least amount I'm going to do. No, that covenant works like this. You're going to do all you can and more. And what God realized, what God knew from the very beginning is he was going to make a covenant with us. And he was going to die on the cross through his sacrifice. We saw that with the animal skins. We saw that with the ram caught on the very mountain that Jesus was later crucified on because he loves you. And here's the conversation that either goes through God's mind or he at least he tells us about in scripture is he's going to make a way for us. He's going to bless all the nations to the promise of Abraham. How is this more exciting? Because here's the conversation. We weren't going to be able to keep our end of the covenant. See, in a contract, two people keep their end of the deal and the deal goes through, but we can't keep our end of the deal. In this covenant, we have worshiped things and in some cases, false gods. We don't think all the time that God is greater. We think things of the world are greater. And and, and so God, as he's going through Um, what we can see, what he tells us that he he knew was going to happen is he knew that he wants to have a covenant and a relationship so bad that he kept his part and he kept your part. Uh, We belong in the punishment of sin. And so Jesus comes down in the form of a man and he does our part. This is how God is greater. This is how he was greater. This is how God is greater. He has been telling us, his people, since the beginning, since in the garden, before they were expelled, there's going to have to be a new covenant. And you can't keep up your end of the covenant. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to do it for you. And this is why every Christian should realize with every breath that we have, with every piece of energy, with everything that's within us, we should go and tell of the greatness of God and actually live it out loud, deny ourselves some some short-term satisfaction to live for the greatness of God. Why? Because this is so great. And where we couldn't keep God's covenant, he kept it for us. How will we live in the world then? How can we not live for God? How can we not bust out of here and tell the world? How can we we live in the world but not of the world? We just have to realize how great God is. You know, sometimes the second graders get it. God's greater. God can do it. And sometimes as we're adulting, we forget. We think, well, the the sickness is greater. My abuse was greater. The things that happened to me were greater. My finances are greater. These things are all getting in my way, and they're great. Oh, my worry, this world, it's greater than God. No, God is greater. It's a simple concept, but it is not simple because we forget so easy. As people who are trying to deal with everyday life, we get mixed up. We start trading the things of God for the things of the world. We start obsessing about the things of the world instead of obsessing about the things of God. And it's not right. God was so careful to follow through on his part and your part. Hey, as we go to communion this weekend, as we get prepared for a season that our country will stop and have to acknowledge that our Lord is greater that he went to the cross because not only could we not do his part, we couldn't even do our part. Every inch of our soul should scream that God is greater. And the way people will hear it will always be with the way you speak. It'll be with the way you live. Is there something in your life that's greater than the Lord right now? Well, we know the answer, if we think about it, is no. But do we live like something is greater than the Lord? Is something greater than the Lord? No. 
But sometimes the world and the sin of the world and, and what we see, we look at a problem and when God tells us he can fix it, we laugh like Sarah. Because we've never seen it. What I hope that you do is you read God's word and you look across the aisle in, in this Bible teaching church and you'll have an example of the miracle of God where somebody around you lives because they know God is greater. Maybe there are several things in your life like you're treating them greater than God. Take this time as we go to communion to put God in his rightful place. Acknowledge that he did his part and your part. That simply gives him the status of greater. If you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, communion is for you. It's your time to dedicate the things in your life to God, to reassess, to praise him for what he did on the cross. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, communion's not for you yet. You need to decide to be baptized in him or repent. Come to, to accept the free gift that he paid for on the cross. He did our part. Christians have to wake up and remember that God's greater. And, the, and people who are not Christians yet, you have to wake up and realize that this God loves you so much. He's been telling you for thousands of years what he was going to do. He never misses. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Embedded in your word was your story, your prediction, your prophecy, and your love. All to show us that your power is greater than anything that we could imagine. Your plans for us are greater. Your blessings are greater. Your kingdom's greater and your church is greater. Lord, I pray that every person here will make decisions knowing that you are a great God. It's in Jesus' name, amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God is running.
mercy of the goodness. 